a lot of you listening to. Um, so thanks for being here with us in this experiment. And again, thanks to Brooke and Marion and to the other readers tonight. Um, okay. I have um, four poems for you, three or four, depending on how long I talk in between them, introducing them and everything. Um, and I will go ahead and get started with the first. Um, this first poem is also the beginning poem of the manuscript that I recently completed. Um, and it's also the title of that manuscript, the title poem and the title and the first. So here we go. It's called a cicada. The cicadas were a sea of sound opening the lungs of the air. Everything was part of those breathing or else it was the coffee grounds sledging the sink. I was alone, which means estranged from myself. Or estrangement was collective and I was a part of that splitting. The 21st century slid over us like a mirror, flat and bright. And though images are not what the image replicates, I tried to grab each one. The cicadas were alive and they were dying, a song of summer that rose and fell. Swimming pools filled and emptied, blue valves into the bigger blue. And the country called itself a country, protecting its monuments to a history of subjugation. Cars gleamed in parking lots, reflecting light. Far from home, I knelt on a quiet road, asphalt shot through with mica, under the street lights, under the moon. The cicada writhed and twisted, a sticky winged green pulsing within brittle armor. An illusion of coherence released me then as I witnessed this crisis of becoming, a body wrenching out of its own body to birth itself. There is no image to describe this. When it was born, the cicada was silent, alone on the street with me. Um, the next poem that I have for you is, uh, so I've never, I've never read the Thomas Wolfe um, novel uh, belonging, or sorry, um, You Can't Go Home Again, but that didn't stop me from basically stealing that first line um, for this next poem, which is called Belonging to the Present. Belonging to the present, you can't go home. And still I carry everyone I've ever held. Now driving fast over a back road in Massachusetts, just to feel the almost grace of impact coming back to earth. You gave up smoking. I carried life then, a small death. Somewhere in Georgia, the one who shaved his head went electric. The words I said to my beloved became strangers here, where a body is never not or solely symbolic. Images, apparitions on the breath, real and tangible being, sometimes consuming me, other times moving through me. The breathing green of North Carolina rose like the sea. This world was not me, but became mine as I gave myself to it. We watched the sun go down in Philadelphia, standing on a bridge that rose out of history over a river on fire. Um, when I was arranging these poems, I realized that this last one I just read you, um, it refers to this idea of not being able to go home. And obviously that's kind of a sort of metaphorical home 
but then this next poem that I that I'm reading was written at a very different time in my life and it's kind of actually documenting a little bit of a, a literal road trip home so just that kind of bridge from the metaphorical to the literal and just different stages of life these poems were written over a long period of time maps off I am listening to static I am changing channels gazing into the eyes of any dog who barks out the window of a car parked in this four lane traffic jam. I am inefficient, sticky, with proclivities I can't be sure the source of. Cloverleaf, the highway, a four leafed clover. I search for luck and find mutant bees in a meadow of lilac. Did I imply a disturbed pastoral? I meant to say the space where our imaginations meet is overdetermined. I meant to leave my own fecund dread tangled in a median strip, blooming daisies. And this last one I wanted to finish with because I think it's the reason we're all here. It's called Despite Distance. Telephone lines on the street bloom as they are seen. A dense mesh of ivy against the kitchen window, greening the received light, lives inside me now, having grown against the window of my home. That summer, when I asked my friends back home what it feels like to want, C said, desire is my politic. And I took that to mean constant. Yesterday, walking the streets of an unfamiliar city, I felt the impassable distance that can open between anyone. The sun was pouring, kids ran through broken light, sky the blue of cloudlessness mid-June. Buildings softly crumbled into the earth and people dressed in their customs obeyed the laws of traffic. All the birds eating trash off the street took flight before the cars hit. I said to no one, what day did you live without fear? I said just once, I wish you would hold something soft against your strong and artful neck and forget every system of order you've internalized. Here I am reaching through the chromatic anarchy of my senses the blue in my mind touching the blue of the world, which the blue of your mind also lives inside. Thank you all so much. Amanda, thank you so much for sharing with us and being the first to do so. Um, it's been wonderful to listen to you. And um, again, we just wanna thank you for sharing. It takes a lot to get online and do that. The next poet that we have, in our lineup is Natalia Conte, and Natalia is pursuing her MFA in poetry at NC State University, where she serves as a graduate teaching assistant in the first year writing program. She also is an assistant poetry editor for Narrative Magazine. And Natalia, if you are ready, we will have you take it from here. Oh, awesome. There we go. Hello. Um, it's so great to be here tonight. Um, it's very lovely to see so many friendly faces in the audience. Um, I'll be reading three poems tonight. And um, in the process of trying to figure out what I was going to read, I actually had a conversation with my sister. And she's one of those essential, um, essential people who are working right now as a physician's assistant in um, the surgical division. And she actually told me firsthand, she was like, I'm really excited to come to this reading because art is really important right now. And it kind of sh shook me a little bit considering the fact that she's doing a job that is so incredibly important. And to think that a lot of people are relying on art right now makes me very happy. So I wanted to give her something hopeful. And I was going through all my poems and I was like, do I have any hopeful poems? <laughs> Um, but hopefully I create an arc tonight. I'm reading three poems right now. 
that um, the first one discusses a lot of human emotions of fear and worry. The second one discusses a little bit um, about loneliness. And then the third one has a transformative element to it. So hopefully that arc will provide some, um, some fun stuff for all of you guys. So the first poem is called Giant Blue Octopus Streaming in HD. And it was based on a beautiful video that I watched that actually showed a cephalopod underwater dreaming. And in the process of dreaming, it changes colors in its sleep. So I thought that that was a beautiful landscape to create a poem from. So this is Giant Blue Octopus Streaming in HD. First veined like Calcutta gold marble, then flushed maroon as king crab shell, the cephalopod sleeps against the black ocean, dreaming. Her eyes scurry under bumpy lids, set deep in bone-like sockets, run with the crab she imagines hunting as the creature scores the coral floor unaware. Her body convulses twice, pantomimes the sweet suck of tentacles, latches to the shell and tugs her prey tight to her parrot beak. Gore stains dark against the plume of shock white, Dream drains the blood from her body, the thrill new as first kill. How real it must feel, suckers dining first, tasting the snowy meat of exposed underbelly. How she must crave this as she pries the valves apart, her body disappearing like plum skins into night water. I imagine, pig I imagine pigment sacs exploding under my own skin, want them to dip me into ink, my toes like the tip of a horsehair brush. As her tentacle unfurls like the whip or a curl of a Sheba's tail, it dances untethered, free against the temple of her enormous pulsating head, and I am jealous. Gills billow like kombu kelp as she softens into ecstasy, mantle full of fragrant feastings. And good God, wouldn't you want the same? A night where your body isn't betrayed by your own enormous head, where you think of nothing but full, but feasting, but content, but you are soft flesh as the scene rumbles to a close. You are stilt legs running from the suck and gulp because night doesn't lay fireworks under my skin, doesn't let me dream of eager predation. Night finds me cowering under salt rock and eats. Okay, so that's the first one. Um, the second one is um, called Heidi the Octopus Tells All and it's basically a poem um, that centers around the same octopus, only it's a persona poem, which means I will be the octopus in this one. <laughs> um, but it's discussing um, some very human themes that I think are universal for a lot of species as well. So this is Heidi the Octopus Tells All. Named for the uncanny way in which I blotched my body, like lichen snugged rock or an eclipsed swoon or the great abyss of an innie belly button. I refuse to let my captors view me unconcealed, not without my permission or the right shade of loneliness against their unremarkable skull or the pull of an oyster shell suction distance from my molted beak. From my very beginnings, I formed like river muck to the pipes, scaled the gloss of my enclosure, buried myself until sea sand formed a pinched crown around my mantle. Of course, I wanted to be loved, wanted to consume my own reflection beak to beak, my captors once cheek to cheek sleep now in separate beds. The husband's cheek to the glass. He asks where Heidi is today. He asks why I haven't come out to greet him. Um, and that's actually, yeah, based on a true story of an octopus that's in, um, that was in captivity for about five years with a man and his daughter. Um, so it's a very fascinating story if you ever want to look it up. So this last piece is, um, a piece that was inspired by Self-Portrait with Broken Column by Frida Kahlo. And um, I was someone who had scoliosis surgery at the age of 13. So essentially what happened um, was they have, I have metal in my body now, and um, it's a very interesting procedure. They basically fuse the metal to your spine. And um, upon seeing Frida Kahlo's Self-Portrait, I was really entranced by it. Um, there's a picture of her and she's got this column down her back, um, a, like a Roman column and it's all broken. So I decided to write this piece based on it. So it's called Self-Portrait with Scalpel and Vase after Frey Kahlo's Self-Portrait with Broken Column. One, Frida's leg bent by polio, Frida's pelvis pierced by tragedy, the way a sword pierces a bull. She braids fuchsia through her hair, 
nurtures prickly pear, oleander, and floods of orange trees. She makes her body beautiful, paints her masterpiece with wheelchair in front of a floor length mirror, brush end between her teeth. She dapples small push pins into her skin, makes her body voodoo. Two. My body after the scalpel bisected my back, felt nothing like art, saw everything with morphine muddying the corners. A nurse pressed her thumb along my vertebra and I felt heavy, an ache where the surgeon loosed the skin, filled the cut with hardware, laced me like taxidermy. I hung from the halls of my home for weeks, ate canned sirloin stew to grow more blood, let my mother lift my armpits, sponge be clean. Three, one night I pulled my legs onto the bathroom counter, anemia lit by mirrored walls. I needed to separate the bandage from skin, but weeks had gone by, cocooned in rubber like tires on their rim. I waited too long, a child afraid I would leak soft as pastel onto the floorboards. With the pull, I faced the angry scar, a tiger salamander curling around my tailbone, its trophy. I waited patiently for the flood. Some nights I long for a pain personified, but each stitch behaved. My body, a vase filled with violets, a vessel that could hold. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate being here. And that's all I have for today. Natalia, thank you so much for sharing your talent with us. It's incredible to hear from our students um, and the amazing ability that they have with words. And I know that the next time we're able to get to the beach, many of us will be thinking about those first two poems that you opened with. So thank you. Our next poet tonight is going to be Jessica Dion. And Jessica is an MFA candidate at NC State and received her MA in literature from UNC Charlotte. She received a writing residency from the Weymouth Center of the Arts and Humanities and is a 2019 Best of the Net nominee. And I am handing the mic over to Jessica. Um, hi guys, I'm Jess. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, thank you to the libraries for putting this together. Um, it's a nice break to be able to come together, share some poetry, see all your beautiful smiling faces. Um, so I've been looking forward to this. Um, in choosing the poems that I was going to read, and I'm reading off paper because I'm old school and not my screen, so sorry, apologies if I'm not making eye contact. Um, but in choosing these poems, I just chose poems that I enjoy reading out loud uh, versus some that I prefer on the page. Um, so I have uh, four shorter ones. Um, the first one is After the Fertility Test. One. Empty is a strange destination, like arriving at the end of the party. My mom believes the softness of my hips goes against what is true, and there must be some gentler deficiency, the kind where I am not to blame. Two, I go home, I clean, dust and polish figurines, big bellied Buddhas, and Mary in her blue robes. I cook, I burn the garlic, the empty swells in every direction. I avoid your gaze, I want your hands. Even broken, the body carries on with small tasks. Three, wholeness isn't for everybody. Not oranges, not worlds, always halved, always rended. The empty drips between the lack and its name, the one we decided on, meaning promise, the one we don't say. Um, this next one is called Pareidolia, and it's based on um, the brain's tendency to find um, patterns where there aren't any. The most common one being the man in the moon. We see the face because we're trying to make sense of, out, of, out of that meaning. Um, so this is Pareidolia. There's a hyena in the paisley of the landlord's skirt, laughing, though I don't know why. I always see patterns in the travertine tile, a sepia solstice crone, cops of terracotta confetti. This morning, I pointed out a crying man in the swirls of the shower curtain, but you said he didn't look so sad. Instead of counting ceiling tiles, I count the pictures in ceiling tiles. I see the divine in the lines of your face, in the lines of Lorca's serenata, 
and the hymn of She Had Some Horses. You wanted me to talk to the sky, but I never did see the man in the moon, just an outline of a gray beard in the avocados at the supermarket. All of the ink blots look the same. This one's a plane, that one a fish, and they all mean spiritual, not religious. Mercenaries in the medicine cabinet, a circus bear cycling in my clotted cream, spread thin the comforter, where whirls turn willows, bending to trace dirt. I attend the church of your clavicle, touch fingertips to the steeple of your neck, whisper into your hair, hallelujah. Only when I pray to the book or the body does anybody talk back. Uh, okay. Next one is But Sundays. But Sundays are for realizing. The slightest song will bring you back, ignite. Other days are brittle, and who can say I'm sorry and me too on a Tuesday? That inexact release, clavicle, a look, my mouth, your brow, all pull parted and heaving towards something less shivery. The truth is we're truceless and we tend it like some living thing, although wispy, like baby bird bones wrapped in paper mache. I'm easing into feelings of forgiveness, but still remembering that doctored way you cut me out. We wrap up in the same blanket and no one's toes are cold, but tomorrow is Monday. Um, this last one is based on this really great video I had seen a while back um, about scientists uh, discussing the possibility that we weren't able to see certain shades of color in the past as a species. Um, and they specifically referenced um, the wine dark sea of, of the Odyssey would have been seen as more of a red muted shade than a blue. Um, so there's an epigraph with this one and this is no word for blue. The epigraph. And if some god should strike me out on the wine dark sea, I will endure it, owning a heart within inured to suffering, the Odyssey. In all 12,110 lines of dactylic hexameter, Homer never uses the word blue. No ceruleans or cobalts in either epics, no indigos or ultramarines. His vast avenging sea is wine dark like bloodshed in the name of ancient gods or berry stains on the white sundress that innocence wears thin on a Sunday afternoon. Wine dark like the underbelly of the elapids, venomous in their bite and in their affliction, glints of red as they ripple and swell. How then, I wonder, would Homer describe your eyes? like something I would like to get drunk off and go swimming in without reservation or fear of drowning. And that's what I have. Thank you so much. Jessica, thank you so much for sharing. I don't know about the rest of you out there, but some of these students in the MFA program are absolutely giving me chills. Um, and it's such a blessing to be able to listen to them tonight. Speaking of our students in the MFA program, our next poet tonight is going to be Melanie Tafasian, who is currently pursuing her MFA um, and was the 2020 North Carolina State Poetry Contest um, winner. So without further ado, we will welcome Melanie. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's so nice to see so many familiar names and faces here. It's kind of neat that I get to read for all these people who are far away. So hello to everybody who's here. Um, the first poem that I'm reading is um, one. So right before I started my program, I found out that my great great grandfather had also been a poet. He was a survivor of the Armenian genocide. Um, and so I was able to access um, a book that he wrote and um, it's written in Armenian and in Turkish, and it's been sort of a process that I've been working on the past two years to um, tackle some translations and, and figuring out if I can glean um, anything from his words. It's been a, a special process. So the first poem that I'm going to read is um, ex inspired by that experience, and I'm also reading from papers, so I'll look down. Um, translating my great-grandfather's poems at home with Nora. Afternoon light pierces the kitchen window. 
gray grows cold. Together we lean over the tattered book. Her dark curls graze my temple. Her pencil moves freely along the page. She laughs or sighs or nods in all her understanding. I eye the letters and praise myself every time I grasp a word. I can now read his name easily because I know the way the Armenian A loops like a Latin U. He looks distinguished in the photos. Ink dark eyes, oiled mustache. I see a bit of my brother there and the narrow tilt of his nose. Or maybe I'm reaching for something or someone already beyond the tenets of this world. I remember a few years earlier, the empty schoolroom in Vanadzor where Lucine quizzed me. Each night, a new letter until I could reach from A to F. Mornings in the apartment, I struggled to speak with Svetlana, the woman who housed me. We spoke only food. Her doughy hands filled the breakfast table with lavash, quince jam, salty cheese, white butter from the Russian neighbor. Shelled walnuts were strung above the stove to dry. Eggs hissed in the pan. When they put a poet behind bars, his blood is already moving through the world. 100 years into the future, to this moment, to the hot scone I'm buttering, to all the letters I will never properly pronounce, to Nora telling me the title, 1,000 Flowers. First one. Um, so this next poem uses um, an Albanian phrase that is buk krip bezamer, which is bread, salt, and heart. It's a phrase um, used to sort of signify hospitality and the way you should welcome people into your homes. Um, and this poem is sort of about the insidious ways that various um, cultures have sort of occupied land and the, and the, the influence that they have on, on those people. So this poem is called On Occupation. Buk, bread. All afternoon, we crack walnuts, pick shells from meat, a pyramid of little brains, glossy yolks cradled in walls of flour, kneading, sugar water on the stove, then the rolling and rolling, the long stick and flick of the wrist, baklava. In Kruya, I don't want to write about the women when they jumped, how they held their babies to their chests, wind whipping crumbs from their skirts, hair, I don't want to write about their tears or the silence after. In the apartment, we watch crows drop walnuts from six floors up. Inside, a grandfather cracks two in the palm of his hand, feeds the children. Creep, salt. Before the wedding, we fill white napkins with salt, twist, then tuck them under bras. For safety, she says, from the evil eye. We dance with pinkies linked, circle tables, twist hips, dodge young waiters hefting meat, platter after platter, kebabs and pork steaks, green olives and oil. We descend from the mountains each summer to bathe in the sea. The iodized whiteness keeps us alive. Zemmer, heart. We eat in the butcher's house. Outside, dried persimmons hang like wrinkled worlds. An orange maze, hundreds in the window as we graze off Russian China. I mistake the heart for brain. Lost in sauce, lost in The man refuses to speak in his house, so we are lost when it's an eggplant. An empty silence when asked to pass the, or the. No one can decide on Kamshi, so we say it anyway. Later we drink and tea made from wild time. Failing to find the word for thank you, we settle on grazie. Okay, um, and this last poem that I'm gonna read is a, is a newer poem that I uh, wrote recently, um, thinking about the children will fear, um, and my younger brother, so, whose birthday is today, so, happy <laughs> birthday to Jacob. Um, this poem is called The Children's Work. I woke in the night, imagining how the neighbor girls must have found the kittens, dust covered, indiscernible, crusty eyes, motherless and moving, their teeth sharp sewing needles, young, eight or nine, with the kittens and chin towels, took them to the garden, where a black cat panted in a shallow box, her nipples fat, aching with milk, a reminder of those she'd lost days earlier. 
The frail kittens need her, crackling with bone. The girls brought bowls of her, dishes of chin bones, swung their legs over the thick wall. The kittens warm body, but refused to suckle. They grew smaller. They sang. They when my younger brother was born, my mom bought us a kitten, orange, no bigger than a Hi, sorry. Can everyone hear me? You just came back. Okay, should I start that poem again? I don't know when that stopped. Yes, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry about that. I don't I don't know what happened. Okay. Um, so this poem is called, it's sort of a long one, sorry to start it again, but it's called The Children's Work. I woke in the night imagining how the neighbor girls must have found the kittens, dust covered, indiscernible, crusty blue eyes, motherless and mewing, their teeth sharp as sewing needles. The girls, eight or nine, took them to the garden where a black cat panted in a shallow box, her nipples fat, aching with milk, a reminder of those she'd lost days earlier. The kittens needed her, paws crackling bone. The girls brought bowls of yogurt, dishes of chicken bones, swung their thin legs over the brick wall. The kittens mewed against the stopped mewing, died. When my younger brother was born, my mom bought us a kitten, orange, no bigger than a I took it for mine, played mother, then tiger tamer in my bedroom. My kitten grew into a cat and my brother grew into a fearful child. For years, every morning, we would wake to find him in a different bed, wrapped in the sheets of whoever had allowed his sticky body against theirs for the night. Natural disasters, his biggest fear. Driving the cold coast, he cowered at tsunami signs, trees bent in the wind's shadow. He worried the mountain that loomed over our town would erupt, engulf us in ash, or worse. Older, I made a point to tell him how dumb he was. But when my cat, who had slept every night on my chest, went missing. It was his bed I crawled in. I wasn't stoic like the girls who never cried as they set the dead kittens in a shoebox with a grass bed, buried them under a dirt mound marked with a daisy chain. No, I wept. I pressed my wet face against my brother's chest. All night, we listened to the coyotes howl. All right, that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing with us and um, also for being patient um, while the technology was going in and out, but it was definitely um, wonderful to hear that last poem again. So thank you so much um, for sharing with us. And then right next to Melanie, we have our next poet, which is Alex Webster who received her MA in English from Missouri State, where she worked as an assistant editor for Moon City Review. Alex is currently a second year MFA candidate here at NC State, and we are very excited to listen to you read. So I'll hand over the mic. Oh, can everyone, can you hear me? Okay, um, hi, um, thank you everyone for being here. Um, my, Reading is going to be pretty simple. Um, I, it's just one kind of a long poem that I wrote my most recent poem. So um, that's what you can expect. And it's about my, um, a, fr a friend Paul that I had at one point. Paul, a couple of months after high school graduation, I found myself hot boxing in Paul's Jeep Cherokee, trying to roll joints as good as his, but I forgot how to use my hands. These things tended to happen in those special summer months when I was back in town to visit and blister stoned by the river. The months before, Paul would move to study science or rocks, something reasonable at UC, 
and I would leave undeclared to study something as risky as myself, a major disappointment. But these are just some of the facts I have left to give, little pieces to place here and there in hopes I might believe that Paul and I were closer than we were. In reality, we were just short and voted most funny in the middle school yearbooks. I am telling you this because a couple of months after summer ended, I tried heroin for the first time in a drummer's beat up blue sedan and Paul began to hear voices. The news was told to me by a mutual friend I would sleep with whenever we weren't in love. Paul sort of losing his mind, my friend said over the phone. I remember this because it was final week of the fall semester and I felt like I was losing my mind. So what, I said, aren't we all? Sure, Paul was known as the screwball, the spastic, fanatic, fantastic skier who nonetheless seemed doomed to stay scrawny and a virgin. Paul and his sea of freckles, never meaning to be brutal and bolder when he began to scream out in mid, out mid sentence, spastic song, searching for the perfect pitch of purple. What I'm trying to say is the last time you see someone, you see the first time. In fifth grade, the year I met Paul, that famous year my family moved from the city plains to a mountain town in the Crystal River Valley. Fifth grade, when I was known exclusively as the new kid, as the short, spunky girl who said naked instead of naked. And so, when the first end of the day bell rang, I was not unhappy, but standing alone along the brick wall as I waited for my mom to pick me up in her new tan Toyota Forerunner. Paul must have seen his chance as he departed from his tight circle of friends, came close enough for me to see him blushing. Even then, I knew when a boy wanted to be brave. Give me something akin to a heart secretion. Show me what was moistening in his pocket since math class. So when Paul threw the crumpled note at my feet and turned to run full speed in the opposite direction, I didn't laugh. I waited until he disappeared before crouching to uncrumble what message laid below me. I don't remember what he scribbled, just the personal touch of signing his name and elegant loops of blood. And anyway, schizophrenia runs in his family. And anyway, he dropped out of college and then your guess is as good as mine. A couple of months after college graduation, I find myself getting high in my parents' somewhat flooded garage. I'm rifling through the boxes, sharpied with my name. In one, I find a folded mustard yellow letter Paul wrote me at the end of seventh grade summer, before my family decided the Plains was where the real heart was. In all caps, Paul wrote, Dear the beautiful Alex Webster, and scotch taped across the heart of his chicken scratch, a tuft of his reddish hair. I don't know what all this means, so I take a picture for posterity. And in the picture, you can tell the day is sunny and maybe a little windy. I am only half a high ponytail shadow, and if you look close enough, you can see a strand of purple in Paul's hair, almost the same shade as the tiniest summer flowers who found a way to grow in the concrete driveway, who, in the end, must have been more patient than the dark, more forgiving, somehow more in love. Who then, I must ask, is listening in the dark for the first cracks of light? That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. That was wonderful. Thank you so much um, for sharing with us. Um, I really feel like I know the person that you were depicting in your poem, um, which says a lot about your ability to convey those things in words. So 
Um, just a reminder, if you are out there and you are listening, if you would like to share some love with any of our poets, we invite you to do that in the comments section. I know that some of you have been doing that already. If you have a question for Alex about her poem or any of the other poets, um, you can add those in the chat and they can respond to you there. Or after all of the poets have wrapped up, we can do a Q&A at the end if that would be of interest to folks. Um, but again, we just want to thank the MFA program for having their students come and share their gifts with us um, because that is the last of their students that will be reading. And the last couple of people that we'll have share with you are going to be some of my colleagues from the libraries at NC State. Our next poet is Chris Fidiello, who is a Durham-based arts writer, performer, and poet. His most recent books are Irresponsibility and Obedience, which are both from Asada Press. And I will pass the mic over to Chris now. There, unmuted. It was cool to hear applause from, uh, from Melanie and Alex's place. So yeah, finally we got to hear some clapping. Here's some clapping for everybody who's read so far. All right. <laughs> Um, I've been uh, I've been doing a, a subscription poem a day thing for people and so I'm just gonna read a bunch of those just uh, I started it when we all started um, you know staying in our houses so um, a lot of these are, are those poems and they're, they're short just a bunch of them in today's news the pink azaleas clean sheets Nepalese garlic soup what calls to us and what we call in an F-350 idling for half an hour. Perhaps freedom is only momentary. Sleeping without the alarm, I look out the window, not at the clock. Listen to the density of birdsong. This light for this date, this number of cardinals up, maybe 738? Find the phone and push the button. No, it's 737. Pillowcase, a day from rank with night sweats. I must be working something out. I was aware that my fear was irrational, but I obeyed it. In today's news, pollen gilds the parking lot puddles. Torn clouds cover Orion's feet. Still, when abstraction sets to killing you, you've got to get busy with it. Unseen trash trucks rev. I can't stop chewing the inside of my mouth. Everyone is stuck in their houses and their hair is getting longer. A city of Rapunzel's. As we walked along the creek, I looked up at the wind in the trees and thought of the, th the flat smell of a hospital ward and already 30,000 dead. I wondered if I were in hospital as either patient or doctor, if I would be thinking of the sound of wind high in spring trees. Although I felt a powerless guilt, I also felt like most of us would probably be all right. Reading the news by the azaleas, Batucada with Requiem. Belief can suck it. Joy, I did a small meaningless thing. The wood screws are now separated from the metal screws in old salsa jars. Rejoice, applaud with glee. Perhaps tomorrow I can turn all the cans in the pantry so their labels face out. In today's news, a Camaro disturbed a robin. A prayer was recognized as a way to avoid action. The rain evaporated from the pavement in the shape of a reaching hand. Who told you that we come into this world to be happy? The bottom of a lemon rotted out. I'm tempted to write about the wren on the dogwood sapling, but I know that's just because the typewriter faces the window, although that's more the impulse to narrate experience than temptation. As if one's experience should be sorted into ranked categories or resisted if mundane. Meanwhile, the wren has flown away and now the poem is about me, or rather 
about how I have arrived at the point that I understand I should have simply written about the wren. Cloudy twilight, willow oak branches underneath go black. I am struggling to maintain my good evil balance. Until eventually you just presume that the news will be essentially the same, just with slightly different numbers filled in where the sentences have numbers. Time shifts from New York minute to geologic. Jesus had to die, like the women James Bond sleeps with early in each film. The brisk walker, the show pony jogger, the hunchback, butterscotch mom, popsicle yoga pants, Mr. Ponytail, the zombie couple, Mrs. Box hair, hot mom and the scream twins, grumpy dog mom, and the woman with the voice like a bandsaw who always shouts into her phone as she pushes the stroller. I won't tell you what we call her. Quiet street. I guess all the dogs have shit. Maybe I'm a wren. I can't seem to take my eyes off of them. Maybe we're all wrens in different bodies and forms and even the trees and coffee cups are wrens. And birds aren't a taxonomy, but a condition of being something small and anxious and about to fly. 3.52 a.m. in wadded sheets amid liminal decision to get up or not. The rushing sound of a wind spilling up the channel of the street and curling around trees into the yards of the houses. Pushing through the window screens to play the hair of sleepers like a surf into tidal pools. And it hit me. Air is a liquid mass. Wind is waves. We are underwater, limpets and barnacles and anemones. And I saw the planet from space, a spherical shore of craggy pools churned and ladled by atmospheres, an aquarium eye without body or intelligence. Then the freckled rain came and a siren on probably Roxborough Street. In today's news, Cold winds made the sunlight bright and honest. A man in a black bathrobe dropped four wine bottles into his recycling. I couldn't finish the book, even though there's only 20 pages left. The Parmesan was moldy. I lit a candle just to light a candle. A cat slept in a laundry basket. A wren said harsh things to a cardinal. The day was terribly long and suddenly short. A spider died in a soap dish. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lisa, Chris. Um, the next time I see a hairdresser in person, I will tell them about your city of Rapunzel's. I love them. Um, if you are not someone that has the fortune of knowing Chris, um, you might not know that he sometimes will dress up as a fox and go to events and write people poetry. It is an absolute delight. Um, so thank you for sharing those thoughts with us here tonight. Our next poet um, is another one of our colleagues from the library. So his name is Chris Tinelli, and he is a founding editor of the Independent Poetry Press, Burrs LLC, a director of the NC Book Festival, and the author of five chapbooks and two full-length collections of poetry, most recently, Whatever Stasis, from Barrel House Books in 2018. And so now we will hand the mic over to Chris Tinelli. Thanks, Brooke. Uh, thanks for organizing, you and Marion. And <clears throat> it's really fun to have super talented colleagues at the libraries. And um, great to share campus with so many talented uh, poets in the MFA program. Uh, so this has been really fun. I'm going to read a few poems from a project called uh, A Test of Company. Uh, Chris Videl and I share a love of this recently passed poet, Emmanuel Hocard. I don't know if I'm up on screen here. Um, here called A uh, Test of Solitude. Um, that means a lot to me. And A Test of Company is a project um, in memory of him. One, small victories, small wars, a famous person played chess in the woods. 
whatever repeats, whatever input we have, a disappearing that knows how to proceed, local realities made exclusively of their own grammar, victorious feelings without victory. Sam calls, our teams are playing, we are getting older, can only hope for a beautiful result. It's hard not to pay attention to the chat. I'll stop fiddling. Two, activity is a truth that conveys no information, a local threat, a distant possibility, autoplay, tabs on tabs on tabs. I buy the hat that my bitmoji had. In a threat of forests, a savant of anger, a savant of nothing to be angry about, a hierarchy of satisfactions, the next activity, the best distraction. It's never too late to stay the same. Three, very few things are not warnings. Cultural touchstones, parlor tricks, the body reacts to what reacts to it. A sort of leverage, a kind of loyalty. Uh, four, this takes on a different meaning during uh, social distancing. Uh, four, specialness is the most ordinary thing and vice versa. The incessant voice of some YouTuber, something your beautiful is doing, an antecedentless sound of your own. The romance of the self, the romance of a movement. Five, the feeling of something new should trigger in you the feeling of something ancient, the exhilaration of self-awareness, a smallness only big enough to exist. Six, activity is rarely a form of work, rarely moves something a certain distance. A kettle of vultures unravels the sky. You unravel. Language, a stranger in you. Whatever it stops, unravels. Whatever it doesn't, goes by. Gets to where it needed to go. Uh, this is a diss track that has been many years in the making. My apologies if you like this artist. I probably do too. Seven, life isn't about finding yourself. It's about making yourself. Is about the whitest thing I've ever heard, Bob Dylan. How can someone who overdoes it so hard underdo it so hard? Nine, I've had meaningful conversations with you in my head. I wish that counted. Sometimes I feel like I'm trapped on the set of a musical, paralyzed by the decision between which words to say and which words to sing. I almost always settle on say. Uh, this is my last one. Ten. What's happened? What hasn't? The difference is about to be forgotten. Do something else forgettable. Good job. Now me. Friendship. Love. Anger. I'm sorry, Miles. I'm sorry, Vera. Thanks.
All right, Chris, thank you for sharing. Um, if you are ever in the Hunt Library and you have some free time after we are back on campus, um, we have some of Chris's poems in the faculty shelf, which is one of the circular shelves on the second floor near Ask Us. So just find the perfect slant of light to sit in, get his poetry, have yourself a nice afternoon, um, and to tell me what you think. I have been so excited to hear from all of the poets tonight. Um, and again, this is a good chance to give them some love in the comments if you haven't already, to ask questions if you haven't already, while I wrap us up with our last poem. Um, and I am just Brooke, I'm our visitor relations specialist and very excited to be hosting you this afternoon. The poem that I'll be reading is from something called the Mistress Series. Um, when I was in a writing workshop, we had to write a series of poems from the perspective of someone that you're not supposed to like. So I wrote about someone's other woman. And I would go and read those poems at open mics and never explain myself. So as you can imagine, I would get some really dirty looks. Um, so that's all to say that this is not autobiographical. And this is called, When He Moves to Texas with His Wife. Sit in a bathtub full of Epsom salt to suck the impurities out of your skin, of scalding water to burn away your virgin whore complex. Slide apothecary soap over every inch his hands have traveled, twice over the places his palms have rested in sleep, concave stomach, clavicles. Use your pumice stone to soften the hardened bottoms of your feet from when they took you flying through the forest chasing phantom promises. See the forest for the trees and use the bark you once carved two names into to cast spells with for rebuilding some form of sacred autonomy. Hang wooden prayer beads over your bed to abolish all the dreams where wedding veils hung torn from trees. Burn the sheets. Before you close your eyes tonight, find a psychic female psalm to sing to make amends with her and find your nightmares will be over. Her face no longer reflected in each pool your parched lips begged for poison water. Your bare and lonely hips no longer forgetting and sleep and thrusting backwards to lock into place with your absent lover. And that's it for me. Thank you, Chris. Um, so before we wrap up tonight, I am just um, running through the chat comments to see if anyone has any questions. We'll give you a good 30 seconds or so. If you have any questions, drop them in the chat box for the poets. I actually have a question and because I'm a co-host, I can actually say it out loud. Um, so Natalia, you started us off with a comment about, um, from your sister about the importance of art. And it's been, I think everyone who is here tonight sort of feels why it's important, but I'd like perhaps the poets to, to talk about, um, especially, you know, like Crispy, you're, you're writing right now or how it feels to be writing or reading in this weird time. It's kind of a big question, but. Um, uh, okay, Marion, I'll give it a shot. Um, uh, but, uh, but I hope other, other folks will respond. Um, uh, like, um, I don't know, uh, it, it was a pretty weird time before this weird time, uh, frankly. It, it always seems like a kind of a weird time. And um, uh, I guess that um, I'm, I'm um, I write, a, I write a lot. I write kind of uh, every day and, and write in a lot of different situations. So uh, responding immediately to the situation in, in writing is sort of something that I've trained myself to do over a good, good number of years. So I might be a little bit of, a, uh, of an exception among poets. Um, I'm, I'm not sort of uh, building a really deep contemplative structure and and really editing it like a like a lot of our um, like a lot of the other readers uh, are obviously doing in their practices. So so I'm I'm really used to you know quick responding in the moment with uh, with with language. It helps me kind of understand what the hell is going on in the moment. If I can get it into some quick language, uh, then I can feel like I have a grasp on it. So that that might be a long way of answering like how how art helps. Um, both consuming, but also producing art just helps me kind of apprehend the world and, and figure out what, what, is, uh, what it is actually adding up to. It'd be cool to hear somebody else respond to that too. 
And poets, I think I've unmuted all of you. Um, I'll respond. So I think, wait, everyone, we're unmuted. Okay. Um, I've found during this time that it's a, I'm having a hard time writing about anything that's unrelated to what's going on, and even if that's sort of peripherally related. But one thing that I've been doing a lot, um, in addition to writing, is listening to a lot of poetry podcasts. It's been a really nice, there's a number of podcasts that are doing like a poem a day. Um, I think that this is a really great time to turn to poetry, um, even if you're having trouble writing or if you're not um, a writer. But um, Tracy K. Smith's uh, podcast, The Slowdown, is really wonderful, and she um, does really great commentary um, and has, I don't know, I think there's a lot. We can turn to poets at this time and, um, and at all times, but um, yeah, anyway, that's what I'm, I'm thinking about right now. Um, I can respond very quickly as well. I, um, I think it's been a very different generation process for me specifically. Um, and I'm sure a lot of other people as well, like you kind of have to establish a new normal within your practice, especially as a writer, um, that might not always feel like you're generating as much, but just the fact that you're generating at all is important. Um, I've also found like Melanie that it's been really difficult to write about anything else during this time that um, even if I'm writing about something completely different, the current pandemic is like sneaking into my poems and I look back at the poem and I'm like, oh, this is another coronavirus poem. Cool. Great. That keeps happening. And I think that's okay. And I think that's just a, a natural a natural way that we respond to anxiety and we respond to worry. Um, and I think that all of those feelings are valid and that work is valid. So yeah, I've just been trying to generate as much as possible, but it's, you know, it's not easy. And my work has definitely changed because of that. I'm kind of the opposite of Chris. I think I write maybe the slowest possible. Uh, it, um, I write a lot, but I don't produce a lot of poems. So I think for me, it's more about pro process and like, it helps me figure out my relationship to this thing, just like poetry does all the time. This just happens to be the most prominent thing happening. Um, and then it's just, and kind of like, um, everyone has kind of mentioned that it's hard to not respond to this. It maybe even feels tone deaf to not respond to it. But I think also, the opposite is a little bit true. Like if you respond to it super directly, then it's just like, I've already read the news. Um, you know, what, what are you bringing to the table poet, you know, to, to translate this for us or, or synthesize it for us or something. So, you know, I, I had a friend, or you may even think you were responding and you're not. Like I have a friend text me and he said, I think I'm writing a poem called Pandemic. And I was like, please don't. And, but he really wasn't, he was just writing his work and it, it was through the lens of this thing. And so I think everybody does it a little differently and, and it's, a, it's more about, you know, plugging, plugging along and pushing through. I can't write right now, but I keep thinking about what a poet like Terrence Hayes might write about the injustices that have been sort of amplified by the pandemic in our society. Or I try to think about what Margaret Atwood might have to say about the Italians singing to one another from their balcony um, as a means of a writing exercise, but no words ever get on the page. Yeah, Brooke, it's funny that you say that. I'm uh, currently rereading Terrence Hayes's How to Be Drawn, and I find uh, for myself, I'm much more interested in consuming other people's writing at this time. Um, I kind of hold myself to the standard of write one good line a day, and that can mean I just don't write at all sometimes. <laughs> um, that's just kind of how I'm getting through, is just leaning on uh, other poets' works right now. Oh, dog barking. <laughs> Quiet, Franklin. <laughs> you know, it's um. Uh, there, I was reminded as as a, a couple of folks were talking of uh, of uh, like William Charles Williams wrote a book.
called the Edge that came out in 1944, and and the the first lines of the introduction of it are uh, are kind of resonant. So 1944, the war is the first and only thing in the world today. The arts generally are not, nor is this writing a diversion from that for relief, a turning away. It is the war, or part of it, merely a different sector of the field. Just seems to always ring true. I mean, you can replace almost anything for the word war in, in there, including the coronavirus. So someone in the comments just posed a great question for the poets. They said that um, they weren't sure how this event was going to go, but in some ways it felt more intimate than an in-person reading uh, because we are on the, on the television screen close up. Um, but he asked, or she asked, um, what the experience was like for the poet. So if some of you would be willing to share, that would be great. Um, it's really, it's really nice having people here in my house that are able to sort of nod and make sounds or clap. Um, but it, it's very quiet. I miss um, like head nodding and like mm -hmm, that kind of thing that you get when you're in, in person with other people. Um, so that's, that's one thing that, that you don't get so much, but it's been the amazing thing about it is that so many people who are in so many different places are able to watch. And I've had a lot of people, um, watch me read tonight who never would have been able to hear me read. Um, so that's really special. Yeah, I guess I'll answer <laughs> I basically feel pretty similar. Um, I feel like if I was doing this alone, I'd feel maybe a bit more isolated about it. But um, also sometimes when you're in a reading or something, like you can kind of pick up on like social cues. So it kind of feels like you're more in your own world somehow. But um, this was interesting and it was the first time I've ever done anything like this. So um, again, thank you for everyone listening. <laughs> It's weird not uh, not not hearing if people laugh at the funny lines. Um, he laughed. That's we did laugh. Laugh. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, you know. It's a. Uh, um, I think it's nice from an audience standpoint because you can see people read far away. Um, I uh, I attended a reading in Austin uh, the other night, which was awesome. Um, and uh, you know, it's like uh, that. That's that's good. I love. I mean, it's a great point that Alice just made about remote attendance is pretty wonderful. Um, but, uh, but there's nothing like being in a room with other humans uh, and it's always kind of been that way. So um, yeah, you know, I, I, think, um, I think I like it. Even though now I can get up and get, you know, a beverage or shoo a cat off of um, a pile of papers, uh, it's, it's nicer to be in a room with humans. All right, well, it looks like that is the last of our questions from uh, the audience. So thank you so much again to all the poets. Congratulation to, congratulations to our graduating students. Uh, it was great to be able to hear you share your work tonight and I'll be on the lookout for more of your work in the future as you continue to publish and uh, make your name out there. Thank you to the participants for spending some of your time with us. And also just a reminder, make sure that you're on the lookout for future libraries events, more are on the horizon, and we hope to see you at those as well. Um, but until next time, we hope that you have a great evening and stay safe, stay healthy. We'll see you soon. Thank you all. Bye.